okay, I am officially annoyed that this camera stops freaking working. Hopefully we can get through this flipping lesson. Okay, anyways. So, so far we are now have a part one, a part two, and a part three to this lesson because my camera stops every four minutes. Anyways, what I was saying, just so we are clear, I do not agree with the whole zero and double zero being nothing because I know that there are people who are that size and it's totally fine that you're that size and you are a real person too because you're really small and that's totally cool. Um, I just think that the video was funny because it talks about more the, um, the um, plus size people and stuff. So anyways, um, we're going to move on, but that's what the fashion publishers publishers would do is they would also help you when you and your company when you do something stupid like that uh, a fashion forecaster their job is really cool what they do is they basically are fortune tellers they combine their knowledge of fashion design and history with consumer research and business information they search for facts and they analyze findings and predict trends that will positively affect the amount and types of fashion product consumers will buy basically what it's saying is they know it's going to be in style next year it's such a cool concept to me to know that they like, they're ahead of the game. They know exactly what colors are going to be in. They know what silhouettes are going to be in. They know what patterns are going to be in. They already know this for next year. And then people who own like clothing stores and clothing boutiques and things like that, they can be part of fashion forecasting websites. It's expensive. It's very expensive. I looked into it once just to see, and it's like a thousand, a couple thousand dollars, multiple thousands of dollars a month to be part of a fashion forecasting um, like uh, website or whatever. And you do it if you have a business because obviously you don't pay that just to do it unless you're super rich and don't know what to do with your money anymore. But, um, and that way they can be aware of what they need to start purchasing and what to um, make available to their clientele. So it's a really cool job. Uh, next we have textile designer. These people are the ones who create prints and patterns basically. Okay, so they create original designs for the fabric used in sorts of industries. So they're going to be the ones that come up with the different floral prints, the different geometric prints, the different, um, uh, the different types of stripes, the different types of, um, what's the other word, the plaids. They, they design those prints, okay? They can be surface designers, knitters, weavers, or embroiderers. Um, and then they are, print services are companies that sell print designs to mills, wholesalers, and product developers, and retailers. So these people are the ones who design basically your patterns and your prints. Okay, then we have a pattern maker. This job is crazy. Um, these people are, if I don't know if any of you have ever sewn before, if you never have, you probably have never seen a pattern. But if you have sewn before and you have opened up a pattern, you know how complex they can be. And pattern makers make those. Like they cut out, your outfit that you're wearing right now was a bunch of pieces of fabric that had to be cut out to a certain shape, sewn together to make your apparel. And these people make the paper that you cut your fabric out of. It's just, it's insane to me. They do the different sizes, different, where to put different uh, pleats, darts, tucks. Like they know that it's so mathematical and insane. I can't even begin to understand how people do this job. But they um, are very creative and they are very smart and they are very uh, good at math. And um, they are very, very detail oriented, obviously. Um, I remember when I was in college, I could have taken the pattern making class if I wanted to, but there was no way I was going to do that. But there was a girl that I knew who I used to work out with who um, she had taken a pattern making class because she was interested in it. And we were in the same building a lot because a lot of our classes were in that same building. So I'd see her pretty often. And I would just walk down the hallway by the sewing room and I would just see her outside and she would just be crying. And I'd just be like, are you okay? And she'd be like... <laughs> It's just pattern making. And I felt that. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, this job and this class seems so intense. Like I would never, ever want to do that. Okay, so let's move into textiles. Um, I'm not going to lie to you guys. This stuff's kind of boring. Textiles is the least interesting thing to me personally. So we're going to go through this quickly. So um, yeah, I'm sorry. But this stuff is on your test, FYI. So make sure you study. So um, basically it's from fibers to fabric. It's a step-by-step -step process of the fiber to the yarn to the fabric. Uh, you have different types of fibers. You have natural fibers. And basically if it's natural, it means it comes from nature. It comes from the earth or from animals. So it comes from plants and animals. Um, different ones that you may be aware of would be like wool, cotton, linen, silk, leather, 
um, anything like that is going to be a natural source because it comes from either a plant or an animal. Then you have uh, your natural fibers are broken up into two different categories. Your first one's going to be your protein fibers, and these are ones that come from just animals, okay? So anything that has feathers in it, anything that has wool in it, anything that has leather, anything that has um, that kind of stuff. This uh, picture on the left is an Angora rabbit, um, and they uh, Angora is a very, very expensive fiber, and what they do is they basically just sit these little rabbits, or these giant rabbits on the women's laps, and they just pull out the hair and they weave it into a fiber. Don't worry, it doesn't hurt the rabbit. It's like a dog shedding. Like they have a bunch of hair that you can just pull out without them even feeling it. Some protein fibers you can take from the animal without the animal dying, like wool, angora, um, that kind of stuff. But then obviously you have the ones where it does, um, the animal does die in the process to provide it like leather. So it just depends on your personal beliefs. If you don't really care and you're like, I, you just don't care, then you can um, wear whatever you want, but there are some people who are super, um, animal rights conscious and they choose not to wear anything that comes from an animal. It's up to you, but that's what, um, protein animals come from. Uh, protein fibers come from animals and then you have your cellulose fibers and these come from plants. So you got anything like linen, um, hemp, bamboo, cotton, flax. Um, the picture in the, Bottom right is not marijuana, it is hemp. Hemp and marijuana have very similar um, characteristics because they are from the same family, but they have very, very different effects on people. Hemp is um, a natural thing used mostly for like lotions, um, medications, herbal things, fabric, that kind of stuff, where we all know what marijuana is used for. So anyways, they're not the same thing. Okay. Cotton is a plant source. It is absorbent. It is comfortable. It is durable. It does wrinkle and it does shrink, but it is easy to launder. Cotton is a very, very popular choice that people choose to wear their clothing out of. Linen is a plant source. It comes from flax, the picture on the bottom right corner. It is absorbent. It does have a natural luster to it, meaning it does have a natural shine. It is quick drying. It does wrinkle. However, linen kind of, when it wrinkles, it kind of looks like it's supposed to be wrinkly, if that makes sense. If you look at the picture in the, on the bottom, in the middle, you can see the late, the girl wearing the linen dress that's kind of wrinkly and it doesn't really necessarily look like it's sloppy. It does fray and it does not stretch very much. Okay, then we have silk. Silk is an animal source. It comes from a silkworm. It is absorbent. It has a natural luster, meaning it shines. It's insulating, meaning it keeps you warm. It is the strongest natural fiber, okay? The actual strongest type of silk was spider silk, in case you're wondering. But um, it is the strongest natural fiber, and it is resilient. It dyes well. It is expensive, and it degrades and yellows from age and sunlight. Um, if, you have, if you have silk, you have to take care of it very, very specifically, or it will definitely turn yellow. Uh, like, as an example, my grandmother, she got married in, like, trying to think the fifties. I think she got married in the fifties and she had a all silk wedding dress. Gorgeous wedding dress. Okay. And I remember she pulled it out for me to see when I was like 10 or 12 and it had been, it had yellowed from age and stuff like that. And so just so you are aware, you have to take care of silk if you want it to stay the same color. Uh, when it says it dies well, it means that it holds color very, very well. And yes, silk is very expensive. Like Let's see, like 35 to 60, depending on the different grades of silk, uh, dollars per yard. And let's see, a silk wedding dress would probably take 10 yards to make. And so that's why like silk is very, very expensive. Okay, then we have wool. It is an animal source. It is very absorbent and it is very strong and elastic -y. It stretches very well. It does shrink when laundered improperly. And I'm not talking like it just shrinks the size, guys. I usually draw a diagram on the board to show, but it's like insane the amount it shrinks. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like, it goes from a size for your you adult person, and it, if you dry it, it will turn into, like, a, a Barbie doll sweater. Like, I'm not kidding. That's how much it shrinks, okay? So you never, ever, 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 ever dry wool. And if you ever need to clean it, I would definitely take it to the dry cleaner. Um, it is wrinkle resistant and it is very warm. 
Okay, now let's talk about manufactured or synthetic fibers, meaning they are man-made. They do not come from nature. You've got spandex, polyester, pleather. Doesn't that look comfy? And nylon. Okay, so when this is, when fibers are um, created man-made, they are extracted and they are dissolved in some type of chemical solvent. Then they are spun through small holes in a spinneret. Okay, this is your spinneret. This is the thread being spun out through the holes. And then it is finished and, th um, and then threaded onto a spool. Okay, so that is the process of thread going through a spinneret and being spun onto spools. Okay, just so you know their general characteristics of all of them is they are made from chemical compounds. They are heat sensitive and they will melt. They are, um, they are less to not all absorbent and they are less expensive. Anything that's not natural is going to be less expensive because they can make more of it and they can make it faster with less money. So anything non-natural is going to be less expensive. And um, like I said, it's not at all absorbent. So it's very, they're cheaper. They're, it's cheaper quality. It's cheaper, all this stuff. But I mean, we all wear it. I Polyester, everything, pretty much everything I own has polyester, cotton, or spandex in it. So... Like, I usually wear a lot of polyester and spandex. I think a lot of us do if you wear leggings. Okay, nylon is a very much suitable for hosiery and knitted fabrics because of its smoothness, lightweight, and high strength. Nylon is a lustrous, uh, a lustrous fiber, meaning it has shine to it. It is strong. Nylon is the strongest fiber for, um, for synthetic fibers. So silk is your strongest natural fiber. Nylon is your strongest synthetic fiber. It is very elasticy and it is water repellent and non-absorbent. It's color fast, which means color fast means it dyes very well and it doesn't fade. So like as an example, if you have a pair of black jeans and you wash them numerous times over and over and over again, you may notice that that black starts to fade and turns to kind of gray. That means those pants are not color fast because they don't, they do fade um, over time. Whereas like if you have a pair of black leggings and you wash them a hundred times and they're still the same color of black as when you got them, it means they're color fast. Okay. So, um, they do fray very easily and, uh, nylon melts instead of burns. If you were to hold a pair of nylons up and light them on fire, they're never actually going to catch flame. They're just going to shrivel up and melt. Okay. Polyester is the most popular and one of the early and one of the most popular fibers. It blends with a lot of things very well. And it um, was very, very popular in the 70s. If you remember me talking about this when we went through the history of fashion, it was all the rage in the 70s because of the polyester suit. Remember the man with the chest hair and the green suit? And the, yeah, I showed another picture of him because I knew you couldn't get enough. Um, it is very strong and it is used uh, to make ropes in industries. Um, and then they also has very good shape retention. It's easy to launder. It's wrinkle resistant. It's color fast. So it dyes very well. And it blends well with other fibers. It also retains oily stains. So polyester is a good one. It, um, it blends very easily with lots of different things. So I like polyester. I recommend polyester. It's a good fiber. Okay, acrylic. This is, um, acrylic is kind of like a wool fabric, but it's the cheaper version because it's man-made instead of nature-made. And so this is, they can make more of it and they can make more of it faster with less manpower. They can sell more of it, meaning they can make it cheaper. So it is less expensive. So people will possibly buy acrylic sweaters instead of like cashmere sweaters because it um, is a much different price. If you look at the picture on the bottom, the black sweaters, a cashmere sweater is $129.99. One that looks very similar made out of merino, which is a form of acrylic. Um, is fifty dollars, so you can tell that it's a lot. It's a lot cheaper. However, it does have cheaper qualities. Like as an example, if you look at the picture of the tan sweaters, this is pilling, which is where you get the little um, fuzzies on your sweaters, and so that isn't it a uh, characteristic of it. It does resemble wool. It's soft and warm. It is non-absorbent because remember, uh, man-made and chemical chemically made fibers are more non-absorbent. It is heat sensitive and it can shrink or stretch. Okay, rayon is a semi-synthetic because it comes from nature. It comes from wood pulp, but then it is chemically converted into a solid, soluble compound. So it's a semi-synthetic because of that. It's then dissolved and forced through a spinneret to produce filaments, which are chemically solidified. It is soft and comfortable. It drapes beautifully. It blends well with other fibers. It does shrink and has poor shape retention. It does wrinkle and it does dye very well. So it's a color fast 
um, fiber. You'll notice that um, most fibers that are synthetic do dye better than natural um, because they have more chemical properties to them. Then we have spandex, the greatest thing that's ever been invented in the entire world. Um, it is very elastic. It does add stretch when blended with other fibers. These are what all your leggings are made out of, all your athleisure wear, all that kind of stuff, all the really comfortable, stretchy things that you have, either are full spandex or they have some spandex in them. It does require stretch, stretch stitching techniques. You can't just sew spandex the way that you would normally sew things because what happens if you do that is so they're, because they're tight um, and they stretch over your body at, at an extreme rate usually, um, if they are not sewn with stretch stitching, you'll hear your stitches will pop. Okay. And you'll hear it. You'll like pull up like a spandex pair of pants on. And if you hear like a stitch, like pop, it means it wasn't sewn very correct. Oh, so it wasn't sewn correctly because it wasn't used with, um, stretch stitching techniques. Most of them are used with that. And then it does shrink, but at the same time it stretches back out. Okay. Then we have acetate. This is a high luster. It drapes well. It does lose its shape and wrinkle, but acetate is commonly used for blouses, dresses, linens, linings, wedding and party attire, home furnishings, drapery, and um, upholstery. Acetate is going to be a cheaper um, version of like, um, like, like say as an example, if you have a silk wedding dress, that's probably going to cost you around 10 grand and an acetate wedding dress would cost you around two grand. So example of it cheaper. Okay, iron heat settings. Basically, anything that's natural can be used with high heat, and anything that is um, chemically made, so man-made or synthetic, you use a low heat, okay? Because it, remember, it melts. Okay, woven fabric. This is a textile formed by weaving, and it is produced on a loom and made of many threads. Um, woven on a warp and a weft. So this is an example of weaving, um, that picture. I'm just going to show you some different pictures of them and I'm going to explain the weave a little bit better. Here is some women who are um, weaving and look at the pattern they're doing. Like it's absolutely insane. I couldn't imagine having that skill. Like it's probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I can't even imagine how long that takes to do. Okay. So warp is going to be your lengthwise or your long uh, your longitudinal thread in a roll. So in this picture, it's the light orange. And in weaving, a weft is the term for the thread or yarn which is drawn through the warp to create the cloth. So it is what makes the fabric tight and have a weave to it. Um, hint, weft goes left. I mean, it technically does not go left. It goes right, but that doesn't rhyme. So I always think of weft going left because it's horizontal. And that's how I remember the difference between weft and warp. Here is your plain weave. It is the most simple and it is the most common type of construction. It's inexpensive to produce and it is durable flat on a flat tight surface. It's conductive to printing and other finishes. If you look at it, it's basically the warp, I mean, sorry, the weft goes over one and under one warp, warp over and over again. Under one, over one, over one, under one, over one, under one, over one, under one, over one. And so it's super simple to do and meaning if the, most sim the more simple it is, the less expensive it is and the easier it is to produce. Then we have our twill. Um, weft yarns go under two warp yarns and over one warp yarn. So it's under two, over one, under two, over one, under two, over one. And that's how you create the twill. It does create a stronger weave, making it more durable. Um, it's for upholstery and denim. And uh, the way that I remember this one is, uh, I have to, you have to remember that it goes under two. And so I think of twill starts with T-W-I-L-L -L, and two starts with T-W-O. So T-W, T-W, and that's how I remember that twill and two go together. It is more expensive because it's more durable. Then we have our satin weave. This is where four or more weft yarns are floating over the warp yarns. So it, is a smooth, it creates a smooth, soft luster. It's very drapeable and it snags easily. Sorry. And you can tell that when you look at it, it's going, um, it's going like over four or under three and that it's a little bit more complicated to look at, but that's your satin weave. Okay. Fabric finishes. We are almost done guys. I know this is not the most entertaining stuff to go over and I do apologize. I usually make it a little bit more entertaining in class, but since you just get to hear my voice, I'm doing the best I can. Okay, this kind of fabric finishes, these are really easy because the way that they're done is usually in the name itself. 
So peace dying is the most common type of dying and it is used um, when color is added to the fabric after it's been made. So the entire piece is dyed, okay? Piece dyeing, the whole piece is dyed. So um, most but not all piece dyeing fabric are solid colors, as you can tell right here in the picture. The piece dyeing process is, is dyeing that, those pieces of that fabric yellow. Here's an example of piece dyeing. Some more examples of piece dyeing. Okay, then we have yarn dyeing. This is where um, color can be applied on fibers after spinning into yarns, especially when they have to be sold as such. Knitting yarns and all types of threads, sewing, embroidery, crocheting, etc., are dyed at this stage. So the yarn dyeing is where yarns are dyed. Then we have solution dyeing. This is where manufactured fibers are solution dyed. It's where it's forced through spinnerets, like I showed you before. And the dye is added to the thick liquid before it's forced through the spinneret. So that's the whole process of it being done is this diagram right here. And then it's spun onto a spool. And then printing. It, um, also, printing is where fabric is put through a fabric printer and it adds the print to it. It is the process of adding color or pattern to a design to fabric surfaces. You can easily tell whether fabrics have been colored in a dye bath or by printing because um, if it's printed, it's only um, dyed on one side, okay? If you have turn your shirt inside out, it's very obvious that the print is only on one side instead of both sides. And then, so it's called a right and a wrong side. But if it's piece dyed, the entire thing's gonna be the exact same on both sides, okay? All right, and this is where um, I was gonna tell you guys about tie dyeing, and it is um, threads are used to resist a material to stop the dye. And it's where you put rubber bands on different fabric and you create a pattern and you dye it. And then um, I was going to have you guys do tie dye in class and I would buy all the stuff and it was going to be really fun. And I do it all the time and it's really sad that we don't get to do that. So if you want to tie dye at home, you can. You can buy a kit on Amazon. That's where I always buy mine. And then I would do tie dye in class, but it's sad we can't do that now. And that ends. I miss you guys so much. I hate not being in class. I hate not being with you so, so much. I hope you guys know how much I miss you and how miserable this is for me too. And I think about you guys all the time. And I just wish we were learning together, but stay positive. We're doing the best we can in the situation. And I miss you all terribly. Love you all. Bye.